Well, good morning again. Uh, this this morning, as I mentioned earlier, I really I love these days when we can dedicate our children and just really focus on the fact that God brings life. And often he reminds us of, of with kids, there's such blessing. And, and it also is, you know, sometimes there's a mess with kids, right? But that's that's kind of what the life of faith is, is that it, God has just blessed us with his love and, and care for us. But sometimes we just bring a mess to it. But here's the thing, his love does not shy away in our mess. And so if you're here today and you're exploring faith, or maybe you've been following and, and, and uh, believing in God your whole life, um, you and your mess are welcome here. So thank you for being here today. God loves uh, when we gather together and can worship and celebrate. Uh, this morning, I just want to let you know, this last week, I kind of had an, an encouraging time, and, and we don't always give you updates on everything the staff is doing, but staff and elders this week, we spent some time on Tuesday night and spent a, a, just an extended amount of time praying for you, praying for Seacoast, and just really trusting in, in who we are in our future into God's hand. And it was a really a great time of, of talking about uh, what we believe we're called to, the mission that God has to bring the life of Jesus to everyone and to help us grow in our understanding of who he is as we grow in our faith. So we were able to spend a lot of time just praying for one another, praying for you, praying for the, where God is leading us as a church. And then we got to dream a little bit as we looked at our vision and statements. And, and we're not changing vision at all. The nice thing is, is we know what God's calling us to to do, and we just get to start to say, okay, God, what would this look like as people discover life in Christ? And as we're doing more to be a home for the lost and the wandering and a refuge for the hurting and shine the light of Jesus, as we do those things you've called us to, what specifically might that look like? And so this last week, it was just encouraging for me to spend that time. Uh, you have a great team of elders and a staff team at this church who love you, who love this city, love this community, and, uh, and just are committed to what God is doing here. And uh, most of all, they are committed to making sure that it's about the name of Jesus being lifted up and not us. And so uh, it's encouraging to be with them. And I also want to say, it, I, it is a joy for me to have you all as a part of Seacoast. Um, I hang out with other friends who are lead pastors. We gather together uh, from time to time. And I often tell them that the people at Seacoast are way better than the people in their church. And so, you know, I mean, I love their church. It's a family of God. We're on it. We're in it together. But um, just really love and appreciate this congregation. So thank you for all that you do to make this a great place. Uh, we are going to jump right into our series. We're going through a series called God of Our Fathers, as the song just reminded us. And what we find in this story is that we are learning about the God of our fathers. Now, we're studying the story of these four fathers of faith in the book of Genesis. And the one thing that we keep seeing is that these are people who are unlikely sources of the, of the people through whom God wants to build this nation and, and bring the Messiah and communicate his love and his ways to the rest of the world. He chooses some people who are definitely in process. And they don't have it all figured out. But what we're learning through the series is that it's about the God of these fathers. And we learn about his patience and his, his loving kindness and his righteousness that's been get poured out. And it's all about our God, not the people in the story. And sometimes we read scripture and think it's about the people, but really it's always about our God. And so as we study these stories, we want to learn more about the God of our fathers. So today, we're going to jump right into the life of Jacob. Now, here's where we are in the story, so you know. We start off with a guy named Abraham a few weeks ago. He was called from his land to a new land and said, through you, Abraham, I'm going to begin a new nation. And through you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. And so he wanted to call one person to begin a new nation. And these people, their call was to demonstrate the ways of God to the rest of the world, the ways of their creator. And so we, we study the life of Abraham and how he had to step out in faith and how God was leading him on the journey, even though he had some ups and downs. And he was waiting for this promise for he and his wife, Sarah, to one day have a child together that God promised to them. And they had to wait 25 years for this. And finally, that child was born. His name was Isaac which meant laughter. And then we, we looked a little bit into the life of Isaac last week when Abraham then was tested 
to take Isaac, and, and I would say Isaac in a way was tested, and would God be willing to offer this promise that was given to him and, and hold it, him loosely before the Lord? And so we studied a little bit of the life of Isaac. Now we're skipping another part of Isaac's life uh, where he met his wife, and so, but we're going to pick it up today now where Isaac, who's Abraham's son, is now um, having kids of his own, and we're going to be introduced to a character named Jacob. So I want to invite you to open your Bibles to the book of Genesis chapter 25. And today we're going to look at the beginning of Jacob's life, and we're going to take three weeks to look at the, uh, the life of Jacob. He takes up more chapters in the book of Genesis than any other character, so we want to pause. Uh, Jacob later has his name changed to Israel. And so it's, it's, it's a person we want to understand him well because it, he truly becomes the father of the nation of Israel. And so we want to look into his life. So today we're going to look at the very beginning stages and uh, really leave the story hanging by the end of the morning. But uh, what can we learn from this? So Genesis chapter 25, and there's three parts we're going to look at. So we're going to move through these parts a little pretty quickly. So just bear with me. Pick it up in verse 21 of chapter 25. It says, Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was barren. And the Lord answered him and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. But the children struggled together within her. So there's more than one child, so she became pregnant with twins. But the children struggled together within her. She said, if this is so, why am I this way? If, in, in other words, if God has blessed me now, why are these kids inside of me? Why are they struggling and fighting? What is going on? So, and normally if you ask this question, you know, your parent, you say, why are these kids already fighting? The angel of the Lord, you'd think, would say, because they're siblings. That's the way it's going to be. But, um, but she inquires the Lord, so what's the real answer? And it said, two nations are in your womb, and two people will be separated from your body. One people shall be stronger than the other, and the older will serve the younger. So at this point, Rebecca prays and said, Lord, what's happening with these kids, what's happening in my life? And the promise that was given was you will have two children. They will represent two nations, but the younger one is going to be the stronger nation. The younger one is going to be the nation, and this was implied, through whom I am going to continue this promise, that the nation of Israel will be built. And, and the younger one is the one that I am choosing for this purpose, is, is what's implied here. So, in verse 24, when her days to be delivered were fulfilled, behold, there were twins in her womb, and the first one came forth red, all over like a hairy garment, and they named him Esau. So, um, my kids did not like me saying this in the first service, but they came out like a hairy garment as well, so I can relate. We did not name them Esau, but, and, and then afterwards, his brother came forth with his hand holding onto Esau's heel, so his name was Jacob. And Isaac was 60 years old when she gave birth to them. So Jacob was born. Now, it said he was grasping onto his brother's heel when, when he is born. Now, the, the, we need to understand a little bit about the name Jacob. It's, there's a Hebrew word that's akov, which literally means heel, the heel of your foot. So yakov is a word that sounds somewhat like heel. Uh, and there's some debate about what it really means, but it could mean to grasp onto the heel, if we put it into verb form, which later became an idiom to mean to trip somebody up or to deceive them. So he was born with this. Now, there's this other piece of the name Yaakov. If they did what they common did, commonly did in the ancient Near East, where add the word El at the end of it, which is the name for God, Yaakov El would have meant, may God protect this child. And so there is some debate that maybe a nickname was, was Yaakov or Yaakovel, but somewhere in there it's may God protect, but you drop out that one part, it means to trip other people up. It's Hebrew. It's complicated. <laughs> so his name as he's born and that scripture talks about him, gives him the name to grab at someone's heel or to trip them up. How would you like that name for your life? So some of you are in here today and you say, my name's Jacob. I like my name. Leave me alone. So that is the first part of his life. Let's look at the next. Oh, and by the way, so that became uh, the word for deceiver. Often later, his brother Esau says, see, his name is, he's rightly named as a deceiver. And I looked into deceiver. This is the definition is to mislead by false appearance. I want you to keep that in mind as we think of Jacob's name. If the idiom for it meant to kind of be someone who's a trickster or a deceiver, it's to mislead by false appearance. 
So that's how we're introduced to Jacob in Scripture. Now let's look at the next part. Genesis 25 still. Verse 27. We'll continue reading. When the boys grew up, Esau became a skillful hunter, a man of the field. But Jacob was a peaceful man living in tents. And this means, really what this indicates is that he was a shepherd. So his brother was a hunter. He roamed through the hills. He was skillful trapping and hunting game. Jacob living among the tents just meant that his occupation was he was a shepherd. He stayed near the flocks and took care of things near the home. Now, Isaac loved Esau because he had a taste for wild game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Um, Just side note, parenting advice. Um, Even if this is true, don't say it. (laughs) Don't write it down. Like, oh, you, you know what? Your mother really loves you, but I like your brother. So, you know, but really what this is indicating here is just saying that, they relate better to you. They prefer one or the other. So the Isaac, or Isaac loved Esau. Rebekah loved ja- Jacob. One day Jacob had cooked some stew, and Esau came in from the field, and he was famished. And Esau said to Jacob, Please, let me have a swallow of that red stuff there, for I am famished. Therefore, his name was called Edom, and it's a play on words about uh, the color red and connected to Esau with earth. and um, Not important for this story, but so... He saw this stew, said, hey, can I have some? And Jacob said, first sell me your birthright. And Esau said, behold, I am about to die. So what use is my birthright to me? And Jacob said, first swear it to me. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau some bread and lentil stew. He ate it and drank and rose and went on his way. And then thus Esau despised his birthright. So let me explain a little bit what is going on here. What's the birthright? Again, ancient Near East. If you have two sons, that you would leave an inheritance divided among your children. And in this case, if you have two sons, you have three portions of your inheritance set aside. Each son gets one portion. And the extra portion goes to the oldest son. That would be considered your birthright. So what Jacob was bargaining for here was the material possessions, the inheritance of material possessions that belonged to Esau. Not, not all of his possessions, but the extra portion. So he said, I, sell me your birthright. And his brother says, I'm about to die. I'm so hungry. So sure, what do I care? If I don't eat... It doesn't matter, so sell me your birthright. I don't know about you and like how much you like lentil stew, but like, I mean, I would have gone like at least a ribeye, you know, or something. Lentil stew for the inheritance, I don't know, but okay. So he exchanges, he says, sure, I I swear to you, I'll give you the birthright. And then the last little verse there, tax on, Esau despised his birthright. He didn't value it. He didn't take it seriously. In the book of Hebrews chapter 12, it actually is describing Esau and called him a profane person because he didn't take the blessings and the promises of God that were rightly, rightfully his being the oldest and he didn't consider it. He didn't t- value that. He knew the lineage of their family and he knew the role of the oldest son. He knew that he was about his grandfather Abraham and his father Isaac and this promise to be this nation, this people of God and the birthright would logically be a part of that blessing. But Esau despised it. He said, I don't need this inheritance. I don't want it. I'd rather have what's before me right now. Feed me. You can have this. I don't even care. What is it to me? So that's the second piece of the life of Jacob and Esau. Let's jump to the third piece that I want to look at this morning. It's in chapter 27 of Genesis. And this one takes up a good portion of the chapter. So I'm going to speed through this one a little bit more. But it came about at the very beginning of chapter 27, when Isaac was old and his eyes were too dim to see, that he called his older son Esau and said to him, my son. And he said, here I am, father. And Isaac said, behold, now I am old and I do not know the day of my death. Now then, please take your gear, your quiver and your bow, go out to the field and hunt game for me and prepare a savory dish for me as I love and bring it to me that I might eat, that my soul may bless you before I die. So this is one other thing that happened in the ancient world is this blessing is, is considered this deathbed blessing that often happened. And the father would, it's essentially like his last will and testament. It's his last wishes, his blessing that he gives to his children. Now, this wasn't binding on God. It wasn't as if, if the dad 
said a blessing that God said, oh, I better make that come true. But this was a way of the dad saying, these are my wishes for you and your family. Here's a blessing I pray over you and asking that God would be in this. And whatever he would say was considered to the family to be something you can't take back. And usually this didn't have to do with the, the birthright, the, the material possessions, but more of the spiritual and then the relational heritage of the family. And so what is the blessing that the father was going to give to Esau, his oldest son, which would be normal? But he says, first go out and cook some food for me. Kind of like, let's make a feast. Let's make it a celebration and I will bless you. Verse 5, Rebekah was listening while Isaac spoke to Esau. And when Esau went to the field to hunt for game to bring it back home, Rebekah said to her son Jacob, Behold, I heard your father speak to your brother and said, Bring me some game to prepare a dish that I might eat it and bless you in the presence of the Lord before I die. Now, therefore, my son, listen to me as I command you. Go to the flock, bring two young goats from there, that I may prepare a savory dish for your father just as he loves. And you shall bring it to your father that he may eat and he may bless you before his death. And Jacob answered his mother, Rebekah, Behold, Esau, my brother, is a hairy man, and I am a smooth man. <laughs> Perhaps my father will feel me, and I will be a deceiver in his sight. Notice that. I will be as a deceiver in his sight. And I will bring upon myself a curse, not a blessing. But his mother said to him, your curse be on me, my son. Obey my voice and go and do this for me. So he went and got the goats and she prepared them. In verse 15, she took the best garments of Esau, which were in her house, and gave them to Jacob to wear. And in verse 16, she took the skins of young goats on his hands and the smooth part of his neck. And she gave him the savory food to, and bread and she made, she made it for her son Jacob. So in this part of the story now, the next part, and I have to kind of speed through it. So Jacob now is dressed up like his brother. He has goat skins on his hands and on the back of his head so that he feels like he's a hairy person. And he goes into his father and says, Father, I've come back from the fields. And, he sa and his father says, Who is this? Who's talking? And Jacob said to him, I am Esau, your firstborn. I have done as you told me. Get up now, please eat of the food that you may bless me. And Isaac said, how is it that you did this so quickly? And he said, because the Lord your God caused it to happen. Then Isaac said to Jacob, please come here that I may feel you, whether you really are Esau. So Jacob came close and his father felt him and said, the voice is the voice of Jacob, but the hands are the hands of Esau. He did not recognize him because his hands were hairy like his brother's. And so he said, are you really my son Esau? And he said, I am. So he said, bring the food to me that I may eat of it and I may bless you. So he brought it to him and he brought him wine to drink. And his father Isaac said to him, please come close and kiss me, my son. So he came close and kissed him. And then when he smelled the smell of the garments, he blessed him and said, ah, the smell of my son is like the smell of the field, which the Lord has blessed. Now, the, may God give you the dew of the heaven and the fatness of the earth and abundance of grain and new wine. May people serve you and nations bow down to you. Be master over your brothers. And may your mother's sons bow down to you. Cursed be those who curse you and bless those who bless you. So Isaac here now is tricked. He's deceived. He's tripped up by Jacob and his mother to believe that he is the older son. And now he receives this blessing. Now, you would think that the dad would say, wait, you tricked me. You lied to me. I'm going to take it back. But in the ancient world, his word was so good. It was so important that what you speak out loud that it was binding. And he said, I can't take it back. And when Esau comes back from the field and says, dad, I, I did what you said. Here's your food. And his dad said, wait, I just ate. Who was it I just fed? It was your brother, Jacob. Oh, and Esau said, that deceiver has tricked me these two times. Now, I read this story, and for some of you, it's new. Some of you, you've heard it before. But when I read a story like this, I think, and this is the one, God. This is the one that you are going to build your nation of Israel. This is the one through whom the Messiah will be born. And all the families of the earth will be blessed through Jacob, the deceiver, the one who trips others up. What is up with that story? And as I kind of thought through this story and the process and, and what do we learn here, I think that the thing I love about Jacob's life 
is that I believe that he's a picture of what the life of faith looks like. I think it's great that God did not wait to show us the end product, but we get to see all of the mess and the journey that Jacob was on. We get to see what it means to grow in faith. We use that word often in churches and in, in, in even here, oh, we want you to grow in your faith. Well, what does that really mean? We talk about that as it's a life of growing in our belief about who God is and his promises. And we're moving from unbelief to belief. And the life of Jacob shows us what it looks like for someone who's not quite getting it yet. He is in process and stumbling along the way. How do you think it would be for Jacob when he was born? He has this promise on his life that he will, that his older brother will serve him and he's going to be the nation that God's going to build up and, and he'll bring the Messiah to the world, bless all the families of the earth. What kind of pressure do you think Jacob felt there? You know, sometimes our kids say, Dad, you just expect me to, you know, hit that free throw. I know we practiced it. It's, I feel too much pressure. Yeah, how about like all the families of the earth will be blessed through you. Don't mess this up. You know? So Jacob is born with this identity and this promise that was given to him. And yet we get to watch the story of how he's trying to figure it all out. And I believe that when we look at Jacob's life, we see what it looks like to be in the journey of faith. And there's a couple of thoughts I have for us to look at today. And this is what I believe some things that help us when we want to be people who are growing in our faith. Because I think Jacob gives us a picture of someone growing in his faith. It's interesting, and that's why we're taking three weeks with Jacob. We'll see in a couple of weeks from now, he has what I believe is this conversion moment where he's wrestling with God. And he's asked, what is your name once again? Jacob never says what his name is out loud in scripture until this moment in three weeks from now. Because his name is Deceiver. He's, he's growing in his faith. He's trying to figure this out. But here's a th- few things that I think are part of growing in your faith that we see here. The first thing is this. If we want to be people who are growing in our belief about, in our faith, the first thing is this. It's where do we find our significance? I believe that Jacob is wrestling with where he can find his significance. Another way to think about it is his identity. But I think that Jacob had an identity crisis. Though God promised to him that he would be the one that he would use to build his kingdom, he had an identity crisis. His name was to trick other people up. And what did he say in the story we saw today? What if my dad actually thinks of me as a deceiver? I couldn't handle that. What if my name was true? I couldn't handle that. He was having an identity crisis. He was struggling with what... What, who am I really? Is my name really who I am? Some of you are in here today and you believe that your name is this name that is not given to you by God. Some of you are here and you think your name is addict. You think your name is failure as a husband. You think your name is failure as a child. You think your name is, is deadbeat dad. You think your name is someone who's unworthy. And you walk around with that name as your identity. And you wrestle to, do I believe this? Unlovable. Insignificant. And God's looking at you like, that's not, no, no, no. That's not the name I have for you. Jacob was wrestling with, who am I really? Where's my identity? Where's my significance? This last week, I had the opportunity to spend some time with Mark Laberton. He's the president of Fuller Theological Seminary. I uh, spent some time with him in the afternoon with me and a few other lead pastors. And the conversation we were having was, will the church, the gathering of Christians, be relevant in the 21st century? Now, there's a theological answer that says, of course it will, because the gates of hell will not prevail against the church of God. So, of course, the church will exist in the collective gathering of Christians. But the question we are wrestling with is, how can Christians now be relevant in America for the next century. You see, because our country was really founded, and for the most part, the early days, and the first, I would even argue, couple hundred years, were basically a Christian nation. There was an assumption that people believed in God, and many believed in Jesus Christ, and many even had a, a active faith in some ways. And so his language was, our early years as a country where we were living essentially in the promised land. People who believed what we believed and kind of lived the way we lived for the most part. But now we're not living in that reality anymore, especially in North Coastal San Diego. 
That, I'm just, I hate to break the news to you, but it's different now. <laughs> and he described it as we are living more like in exile. And so we need to see ourselves, if you are a follower of Jesus, as no longer do you live in the land where you look around and everyone believes what you believe and thinks the way you think, but you look around and assume that you probably are one of the only ones who think the way you think and live the way you live and believe what you believe. That's why we like to gather weekly, because we want to remind each other we're not all that crazy. There's other people who are on this journey with us. But so he said, so the question was, if we are truly people living in exile now, essentially in our land, what is the biggest question we need to answer? And he said, the very first thing we need to answer is, what is our identity? And to answer that, he said, here's the question we should answer is, who do you belong to? Who do you belong to? Do you belong to your employer or do you belong to God? Do you belong to your spouse or to God? Do you belong to your kids or to God? Do you belong to your university, to your professors, to your neighbors? What, who do you belong to? When we can answer that question, then we can start to find our true significance and identity. Jacob was wrestling with this question of who do I belong to? Because he knows the story of his, father, of his grandfather, Abraham. He knows the story of the stories of his father, Isaac. And there's these stories of this amazing trust in God, even to provide his 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 mother, Rebecca, this blessing from God, Isaac trusted and said, God, I belong to you, the creator of the universe. I trust you in my story. So Jacob had an identity crisis and he didn't have the answer yet to who do I belong to? Notice in the story today, he actually said, Isaac said, how did you get this done so quickly? He said, the Lord, your God helped me. See, Jacob, I believe, believed in God. He believed in the creator, but he wasn't sure yet who he belonged to. He wasn't yet the one to, he wasn't ready yet to say, he is my God. And so the question he had to answer was, who do you belong to? The question that you and I have to answer in a world like this is, who do we belong to? We don't have time to look at it, but throughout scripture, when we read stories of the people who are living in exile as strangers in a land, you can look in the book of Daniel. You have these characters like Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. They were living in the king's court in Babylon where no one believed in their God. But they had to answer the question, who do we belong to, to attain their true identity? And at one point they said, even if God doesn't save us, even if our God leaves us here and we die, we don't belong to you or to your idolatry. We belong to Yahweh. And we're okay, because we know where we belong. And it gave them their identity. So the question for us today is, who do we belong to? In John chapter 6, verse 68, uh, Jesus was just finishing up a sermon. He was preaching. And it said at the end of it, the crowds left him. They walked away. They, had, they heard enough. And I just said, oh, I just love that. I can sometimes relate to Jesus. So he, so he preaches and the crowds are like, we're out of here. Heard enough of your preaching. And the disciples were the only ones left. And Jesus looked at his disciples and said, aren't you guys leaving too? Have you had enough too? And I always kind of picture this scene like, you know, Peter's rolling up the mic cord saying like, well, that didn't go as well as we thought, you know, kind of cleaning up. And Jesus looks at him and says, are you going to leave too? Do you belong to me or do you belong to someone else, Peter? Just, it doesn't matter. Just make your choice. And Peter said, where would I go? Where else would I go? Because you, Jesus, have words of eternal life. Where else would I find that? No, I belong to you. For us, we need to answer that first question. Who do we belong to? Where are you going to find words to give you life? If it's anywhere other than Jesus, let me tell you that you're going to be on a journey like Jacob with ups and downs and a lot of struggles along your way. We as a church believe that we can find all we need in Jesus Christ. We start with that question. The author Henry Nouwen once wrote this. He said, as long as we continue to live as if we are what we do, what we have, and what other, think about, other people think about us, we will remain filled with judgments, opinions, evaluations, and condemnations will remain addicted to putting people and things in their right place. As long as we answer this question, who we belong to, of somebody other than God, and it's what you do, or what people think about you, or what you can attain, you're going to live your life filled with opinions, evaluations, and condemnations. That's where you're going to find what's going to fuel your identity if we can't answer this question, who we belong to. 
And we remain addicted to putting people and other things in their, quote, right place. And it becomes a form of idolatry, things before God. So Jacob, I believe here, is showing that he's having this identity crisis and growing our faith as we're growing in our identity, growing in our significance. What gives us that significance? The next thing is this, I think, in this story is growing in faith here, and Jacob's shown us, is growing in our trust. We're moving from unbelief to belief in who God is and in his promises. That's the idea of growing in trust. When we first start following God, we may believe that he will forgive us for our sins, but there's a lot of other things we don't quite yet believe that he'll do it for us or that his promises are true, but we grow in time to trust. Jacob here is at the very beginning. He's not sure how much he trusts God. He's not sure if those promises that were given to him are secure. So what did he do? He, he tricked his brother for the birthright because he thought, well, if I'm going to be over my brother and if God's going to use me to bless the world, I'm going to need more stuff. So I need his birthright. That's the only way it's going to work. And, and then I'm going to need my father's blessing. So he and his mom find this scheme because he goes, if, if I don't have this, then God can't fulfill his promise. So with Jacob, is he couldn't trust that God's promise was true. He had to take it into his own hands and work for something that was already his. How often do we try to work for what God has already given us? You have the forgiveness of God. How many of you work throughout the week to prove yourself worthy of his love? When he's saying, are you kidding me? My loving kindness is so much bigger than anything you could ever do to earn it. You're not going to prove yourself worthy of my love. The only reason you have my love is because I love you and I'm God and I can break through. But we work and we strive to get what God has already given us. One of my favorite movies uh, is the movie Sandlot. And, and to me, it's like Sandlot is, if you um, are an American, you should have seen the movie by now. And, and otherwise, you, it should still be part of the process to, un, to understand American culture. So Sandlot is this great movie. And it's one of the most quotable movies you'll ever see. And if you're like me, like a guy, sometimes guys, we can have a whole conversation and only use movie quotes. And, and, and where my wife just looks at me like, you guys are so shallow. I'm like, yeah, you know. Um, <laughs> waxing and lotioning. Anyway, so there's all these like lines from these movies. It's so quotable. It's a great movie. But the movie's premise is these boys hit a baseball over a fence and they want to get their baseball back. And because it was signed by Babe Ruth. So they wanted to get this baseball back, but they didn't want to go over the fence because the beast lived there. The beast was this um, St. Bernard dog that's bigger than them and has eaten people. And, and it was locked up behind this fence forever. So it's back there. <laughs> And they're afraid to go back there. So the whole movie is they're creating all of these little um, contraptions and ways to reach over the fence and grab the ball without getting eaten. That was their whole, the whole movie is that's what it's about. And at the end of the movie, finally, the, the dog, uh, they find out that the dog's actually this St. Bernard that loves kids and loves baseballs and there's nothing wrong with it. But they go to the front door of the guy's house and they knock on the door and James Earl Jones opens the door and he's required for any quality baseball movie. So he shows up and, and, and he says, well, what you guys have been making all that noise. What have you been doing back there? And they said, oh, well, we had a ball back there. and We've been trying to get it. And he said, well, why didn't you just ask me? You could have had it. And I look at that and I think that that's such a picture of our spiritual lives. Is that God has given us everything we need, yet we build these contraptions and all these schemes and we work super hard and we try to figure out all these ways to get what God's saying. No, no, it's, it's here. Just have it. Like, oh, thanks for, for giving that to me. Now, I'm going to wake up at 5 a.m. and memorize the, you know, the book of Lamentations this morning because that way you'll think I'm worthy to have what you're giving me. He goes, no, I'm, I'm giving it to you. And then I'll make sure that I, I never will sin again. I promise I'll never sin again to have your forgiveness. He goes, no, I'm, I'm giving it to you. But we work and we work and we work to get what he's already given us because ultimately we don't trust and who he says he is. We don't trust that his loving kindness is actually true. We don't trust that his grace is bigger than your worst sins. Today, yesterday, and tomorrow. Jacob had the promise of God, but he didn't trust that it was his. So he tried finding a way to get what he needed to have that promise be true. But as we grow in our faith, we need to be people who are growing in our trust. That who God says he is, is true. His promises are true. We learn to trust that he is patient with us. 
We learn to trust that his, his kindness never fails. We need to grow in our faith. I want to invite the worship team up to come on up and to end our time. And as we end our time here today, I, as I said, we're kind of leaving the story hanging because there's no conclusion here yet about Jacob's life. There's no conclusion. We don't, we don't see what happens now. And we look at his life and think, God, are you really building your nation through him? But we wanted to leave the story hanging, and there's a lot more to it. But the reason I like to stop here is because your story is still hanging. Now, some of you are further down the journey. Some of you are just at the beginning. Some of you might be here today, and you say, I'm not even sure I believe yet. But you're in the process. You're in the story. But the one thing that's true that we want to be people who understand is that God will not leave you on the journey alone. He's with you. He's here today. He's here in your pain. He's here in your doubt. He's here if you're skeptical. He's here if you're bitter. He's here if you're just rejoicing this morning. He's here. He's walking you in, with you in the journey. He's here if your name this morning is deceiver. One who grabs the heels and trips others up. And he's with you. And he's not going to leave you in the journey. And so as we end our time here, we want to end our time and we want to just turn our focus in in one song. And you can, where you're sitting, you could just stay there if you want to stand and sing the last song. If you want to kneel, if you want to raise your hands. Let's just end knowing that our story is hanging. And knowing that we're in process. And knowing we're still growing. But let's rest in the truth. That your identity isn't in all the voices that you've told. That you've been told. It's in the name that God wants to give you. And that he's not going to leave you. We can grow in trusting in who he is in this process. So pray with me as we end. God, we thank you so much for this time. And, uh thank you for this morning. I thank you for the fact that even though many of us are in process and many of us need to grow in our belief in all kinds of areas. And Lord, some of us are here this morning and we're struggling with our identity and we need to answer the question, who do we belong to? God, all of these things are in process. And I thank you that you are with us in the journey. And so I ask now, Lord, that you'd speak to us as we end this time and receive our praise in this last song. We give you this time now.